December 6, 2017. Thank you for joining Evolutionary Energy Arts once again. You're looking at a Sumerian relief showing a god with three humans. And so this has just been one of my favorite topics forever and God knows I have spend, spent thousands of hours <laughs> deep into all the biblical texts, all the Sumerian texts, all the different mythologies of the world. And I just find it fascinating and just so exciting and fun to delve deep into these things. Um, Ur of the Chaldees. I'm sure that rings familiar for most of you, um, especially going back to Bible school days, if you ever had any of those. Well, Ur of the Chaldees is where Abraham is from. And so this is over in what is today modern Iraq. And traditionally it is believed that Abraham was visited by the God of the Bible sometime between 1800 and 2000 BC is the accepted range. And so if we look at the Bible verse in Genesis it says, now the Lord, and again, now the word Lord has been, it's, it's, it's basically, it's a bone of contention right there. Um, so now the Lord, L, we could say, you know, in Hebrew, uh, or God, or however you want to say it, said to Abram, Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I shall show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and so you shall be a blessing so God says to Abram and this is before he's Abraham and renamed to leave his homeland of Ur and uh, Ur again is in um, Sumeria, it's it's in Sumeria, basically modern day Iraq. But even that is still debatable as to the exact location. Uh, they think they know where, uh, but again, there are some alternatives slightly farther north than what is accepted uh, traditionally accepted location for it. So God promises Abraham many descendants. And again, uh, anywhere from 1800 to 2100 BC, somewhere in that range is what we are estimating. And the book of Genesis explains that Abram, before he was Abraham, was a faithful man that he believed in the one true God. Abraham's faith was tested by God. For example, Abraham was asked to leave his country and go to a land that God would show him, which would later become Israel. So he's promised that his people will become abundant, his name will be great, and his lineage will just have a magnificent history and number as many as those of the stars. So all he has to do is just pack up and go. So he goes. And so he leaves Ur and starts heading north. He ends up up in Haran and then comes across into to Canaan and then into Egypt. And uh, as we know, he took a very, very circuitous route. And uh, there's so much to this story uh, that we'll delve into in other videos a little bit more in depth. So why is he called to leave? Why, why does he leave in the first place? Now, even if, you know, God didn't really call him, but he just decided to pack up and leave, what was going on? Well, as we know, there was many different gods, many different cultures. Um, this is the uh, Near East, circa 1300 BC, and this is the time of Moses. So at this time frame, you could see the Egyptian Empire here is in, in power. And uh, you have the Hittites, very strong. Assyria over here, the Kassite Empire um, took over um, Babylon and Sumeria down, down lower. And you can see the different cultures. Um, but there have always been wars of the gods. And that's the interesting thing. There has been, as far as our history goes, all these wars by the different gods. And 
you know, the gods fight with humans by their side in the old days, hand in hand, on the same battlefield. And then all of a sudden the gods kind of disappear, but humans are still fighting these wars and have never stopped. So Abraham leads, leaves, and then we jump forward to the time of Moses, trying to find our clues as to who is this God that is calling Abraham and then becomes the God of Moses. And so we have the famous burning bush that was so bright that it terrified Moses. He dropped to his knees, covered his face. He couldn't look upon the sight of the Lord, of, of God. And so when asked, um, when he asked God, what should I say your name is? I mean, you that are sending me to talk to the people and to bring them these Ten Commandments to follow and, you know, about the whole trip. Um, God says something very, very interesting. He says, Eya, Ashur, Eya. So it's been traditionally translated into I am Eya, I am Ashur, that I am Eya. Or it could be I will be what I will be, or simply I am. So God identifies himself here with being itself is the traditional way of looking at it, to be. And then we could look at it as a self-realization thing. I am. I recognize that I am. I am a thinking being. I am self-aware. I am awareness and consciousness itself. And that's one of the things with the Bible and a lot of different holy texts, quote unquote. You could look at them in different ways. You could look at them as simple parables on life, you know, giving you simple truths of how we should live and things like that. You could look into them and find some mystical things uh, that show some hidden knowledge. For sure, there's a ton of numerology in the Bible tons of numerology and there's so many so much allegory and so many things insinuated and then of course when you start to study uh, Kabbalah and you start to study Hermeticism it gets just so much more involved and if you've ever looked into a lot of the rituals of groups like the Golden Dawn that merge the Egyptian pantheon with Judeo-Christian traditions and they start to put all these things together and, and you know, how could you merge different traditions? Well, perhaps it's all the same stuff. Perhaps there's just different titles for the same things and beings. So, Eya, Ashur, Eya, I am. Traditionally, that I am. I am that I am. So perplexing, perhaps, it just pointing towards self-realization and realizing you are consciousness itself, perhaps. There's different, there's different contributions into the Bible itself um, in different traditions. There is one called the Yahwist and then the Yellowist. And... Uh, the Elohist source traditionally uses Elohim because the Bible is not a single book. It's not written by one person at one time. It's, it's a compilation. I mean, traditionally, the Old Testament, the Pentateuch was written by Moses. And all these other authors that came later wrote the other books. But things have been copied things have been transcribed things have been changed and that's one of the things I didn't realize till I started studying about the Masoretic texts and how they've kind of been doing a revisionism constantly as they go and part of it is to cover up things and part of it is to cover up the fact that whereas we think we have a monotheistic religion we truly don't it's it's not a monotheistic religion at all. It's it's a religion of putting one deity ahead of others because they believed in many different deities. 
although each city state each area had its own chief deity they truly did believe in many deities and if we, as we go further we shall see that so over here this is a book that's available on Google I'm sorry Amazon um, Hebrew life and literature selected essays of Bernard Long and just looking at the translations thus this is how it is really written Ka Ashur and then it's just automatically tr uh, translated by the Yahweh, Yahwehist as Yahweh your God commands you so Ka Ashur again it's Ashur and when we look at Ashur, Ashur and Ashur, Ashur happens to be the main god of the Assyrians. He was represented as a man worn that wore a turban. He was also the god of the first capital of the Assyrians, called Ashur. He is sometimes represented riding a dragon snake. Now again, where was Abram? Abraham where did he go and why well or is just south of Assyria uh, Assyria to the north Babylon to the south however there are some scholars that think that what we where we think Ur is is actually it was part of the Assyrian territory so in the ancient Near East, Asher was originally the main god of the city of Asher, the capital of Assyria. Assyria emerged as a great empire. Asher became the national god of all of Assyria. The Assyrians saw him primarily as a warrior god and believed that he supported them against their enemies. By about 1300 BC, Asher was identified with the supreme Sumerian god Enlil, probably in an effort to portray him as king of the gods. Under Assyria's king Sargon, Asher became the father of Anu. So, Anu is the father of Enlil and, and Ea, Enki, and Asher became the father of Anu. So he became grandpa uh, in an effort to make him out to, to be out the superior one. Mm -hmm. I am, you know, the product, the one that produces the lineage. I'm not the result. So. He is saying, in other words, he is the father of the gods, like we see in Deuteronomy. When we read Deuteronomy 32.8, again, assembly of the gods. Okay, they're calling them gods. I mean, multiple. They were polytheistic. They believed in multiple gods. They chose to, to worship one above all the others. They were polytheistic. And, in fact, Abram, in... Ur, he would have probably followed the moon god at that time. Um, and maybe this is what separated him. Maybe he wasn't following the god of the majority of the people. Or maybe he was on a boundary that was so close to that of his neighbors that he decided to go with the neighbor's god. Or maybe the neighbor's god picked him as the gods have always picked different humans for different purposes. So, Asher became the father of Anu, the Babylonian god of sky, and the main creative force in the universe. Later, as Assyria and Babylon competed for political and military power, Asher took on the characteristics of the Babylonian national guard Marduk, son of Ea, Enki. And, as we know, if you're familiar with any of the Sumerian texts, Enki is the creator of mankind. Enlil, his brother, is the, the head god in charge of the earth. Originally, Enki was here on earth before Enlil came. And Enki was Enki, or basically god of the earth. When Enlil came, Enlil basically took over that title. And Ea, Enki, became more the god of the the, the waters and more equated with Poseidon and Neptune um, and basically took a step downwards now his son was Marduk and Marduk um, basically 
ends up killing Tiamat and becomes the national Babylonian god. So he ascends again and challenges Enlil's authority and Enlil's power. And there are so many texts throughout so many traditions talking of the wars of the gods and the wars of Marduk and Enlil. And Marduk took over the area, including Ur. So perhaps that was part of the reason why a follower of Enlil, Asher, would leave and go elsewhere. And of course, this is my conjecture just from my research. I'm sure everybody will, might have slightly different opinions on this. And I love reading your comments. You guys are awesome. Um, yeah, we could figure all this out together when we put our heads together. Um, but Asher, again, national god of Syria. In the beginning, he was probably only a local deity, deity of the city that shared his name. From about 1800 BC onwards, however, appears to be tr strong tendencies to identify him with Enlil. In Akkadian, Bel, which also is Baal, Ba'el, and again, all storm gods. And while under the Assyrian king Sargon, there were tendencies to identify Asher with Anshar, the father of An, or Anu, in the creation myth. Under Sargon's successor, deliberate and thorough attempts were made to transfer to Asher the primeval achievements of Marduk, as well as the whole ritual of the New Year's Festival of Babylon. So, as a consequence, the image of Asher seems to lack all real distinctiveness and contains little that is not implied in his position as the city god of a vigorous and warlike society that became the capital of an empire. Warlike society you know think about that warlike society as we go along and look at the symbols of things and there's a picture of him with the wings again a man in a flying disc with the wings this is the victory procession led by the god asher so he returns in triumph hovering above in his flying disc the gods partake in actual battles and in celebrations, and we find this in the Vedas, in the Vedas, in the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, all the all the Hindu Vedic texts. They all talk about this, as well as you know other traditions. Asher in his flying disc, and he's also depicted as a bird. So. He's depicted basically as a bird in a flying disc. And you can see that he always has his wings. And so his sign of the eagle passes on to the Roman Empire. So the power that is Rome. So who was the chief Roman deity? Jupiter. And, and of course in the Greeks we have Zeus. And when we look at the symbols, Zeus in the ancient Greek religion, chief deity of the pantheon, sky and weather god, who is identical with the Roman god Jupiter. His name clearly comes from that of the sky god Dias of the ancient Hindu Rig Veda. Zeus was regarded as a sender of thunder and lightning, rain and winds, and the traditional weapon was his thunderbolt. He was called the father of both gods and men. Enlil, god of the atmosphere, member of the triad of gods completed by Anu and Ea. Enlil meant Lord Wind. Both the hurricane and gentle winds of spring were thought of as the breath issuing from his mouth and eventually his word or command. He was called the Lord of the Air. Although An was the highest god in the Sumerian pantheon, Enlil had a more important role as the embodiment of energy, force, and authority. And his cult center was in Nippur. Now, what country has the symbol of the eagle now? Obviously, the United States. Just like the Romans before us. 
in the Akkadians before that the power of Asher transfers from one people to another the power of Enlil so and this is also very similar to Indra even though they were speaking about a different Hindu god when you really look at Indra you know it's exactly the same you know just exactly he's the god of the thunderbolt great warrior conquers the anti-gods he also defeats innumerable human and superhuman enemies most famously the dragon Vitra. Um so you could see as we were talking also earlier about Baal Semitic Baal means owner or lord and then we get the al becomes el and it just becomes l it just becomes lord although it could be used more generally basically bow again lord of rain and dew storm god same thing again he who rides on the clouds in phoenician he was called Baal shaman lord of the heavens Again, the same deities. And here again, we take a quick peek at Assyria. And talking about timing, because this talks about Marduk and uh, it's Wikipedia. The only serious rival to Marduk after 1750 BC was the god Ashur, who had been the supreme deity in the northern state of Assyria since the 25th century BC which was the dominant power in the region between the 14th to the 7th century BC and the south Marduk reigned supreme. So Marduk reigned supreme and that is the timing pretty much of uh, Abram leaving. As Marduk rose to power, Abram leaves and goes off called by Asher to found a new country, a new people, a new line of power to go through. So, I hope you guys found this interesting, and I really can't wait to hear all the comments on this one. But that's basically where I am at. Um, and you're talking or you're listening to somebody that was brought up Catholic and then ended up going on his own to uh, um, Baptist churches, mostly through my youth. Uh, a Pentecostal church, uh, laying on hands and all that in my, like, around 20, 21. Uh, Bible studies all the time until I studied to the point where I just couldn't believe it anymore. The, uh, you know, I got so deep into it, I'd have 10 different Bibles out comparing all different verses in different forms. This is before we could just go on the internet and google it and see every sort of translation you want to see came to the conclusion that it's not what it seems it's not what we're being sold and um especially the old testament um i think you know there's there's uh, there's such a stark difference between the old testament and the new testament completely different and then when we read the Nag Hammadi texts that we found and we bring in some of the books from the Dead Sea Scrolls and get a more complete picture and understand the Gnostic writings uh, it, it all gets much much more clear and then of course the you know cherry on top of the cake is the the Sumerian readings because uh, everything that we've learned from these Sumerian texts of which there's hundreds of thousands now it dwarfs, you know, what we have in the Bible. The Bible just gives you tiny little excerpts. And you can find the whole stories in the Sumerian uh, writings. And when you look deep and close, you'll, you'll start to see a different picture. And I was obsessed with this. I, I read the Bible from cover to cover at age 11 for the first time. And then I've actually copied the Bible by hand going that deeply in studying things just different books especially Ezekiel and uh, you know a lot of the prophetic books I was all caught up in, in prophecy and looking very very deeply into them and so 
the deeper I went down the rabbit hole, the more I realized that the traditional viewpoint is, you know, something I can't believe in. And however, I think there was a lot of information in there that was fascinating, you know, and, and enlightening when we look at all the other world texts put together. And when we start to study all the different traditions, you know, we, we study the Hindu traditions and we look deep into Buddhism and, and Taoism and every different you know religion that's out there. Um, better than 55% of the world comes out of the Abrahamic religions. Most of the world's population follows these Abrahamic religions. And honestly, what have we had but nothing but dissension and war our entire history? And I'm not going to blame it all on the Abrahamic religions, but it feels like it comes down from the gods. You know, children learn from their parents. And uh, it certainly seems that the wars of the gods are never ending. And uh, it's something to think about. So I look forward to your comments. If you found it interesting, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do subscribe and join our growing family and share with as many people as possible so we can wake people up and get people doing research for themselves. Do not believe what you were taught by your parents, by your school teachers, by your ministers. Don't believe anybody. Go out and research it for yourself. Go look things up for yourself that's where it's at you have to look things up for yourself you have to do your own research you have to do your own discovery and then share what you have found only after you've you know fully done a good exhaustive study and and weigh your heart and your mind together and then share your truth and realize it might not be somebody else's truth but hopefully we will raise up the energy of the world together and open up eyes so we could stop our negative cycle of nonstop wars that we've learned from these quote-unquote gods. So I thank you all for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you all again very, very soon. Take care.